Okay, two comments before I start this video. Uh, Syrian analysis, I created it in 2017 in order to cover the Syrian war. Back then, the Syrian war was in the, at the forefront of the political events. Therefore, it was convenient to focus on Syria, right? And I also come from Syria, and a lot of you, uh, I believe, appreciate the fact that I covered the Syrian war. However, now in 2022, uh, most of the military fronts in Syria are frozen, and there are no big events that I could cover for you when it happens. I'm already doing it. You can go back and see in the videos. Uh, but now I want also myself to expand the work of Syrian analysis to other regions. Therefore, I'm covering Ukraine, Azerbaijan against Armenia, Taiwan, also Syria, the Middle East, etc. And also com should be convenient for you that I'm uh, doing this, right? So I'm saying this comment because uh, some of the commentators are asking me, to focus on Syria, where the fact is, I'm, I check the Syrian news every day and I don't see big events happening, therefore I'm uh, unable to cover it, right? So there is no point of covering it. The second comment is, uh, some of the commentators are asking me, why do I delete uh, some of the comments? First of all, I have never deleted any comment and I would never do it, not now and not in the future, even if the comment is criticizing my thoughts or disliking my thoughts and giving a different opinion, I would never do that. The only time I delete comments when I see is the spams. There are some people posting uh, spam comments with links that you can go and it's a, like a hacking link or something. I'm not sure, but I, I can't really leave these comments to protect you and also for the people to have a freedom to comment and uh, act freely in the comments section below, right? So these are the two comments before I jump in, into our topic of today and how the United States sees uh, from the Nord Stream 2 and Nord Stream 1 explosions as an opportunity uh, for them to sell uh, natural gas uh, to Europe. And I would like to refer to an article published by Aaron Mate. I think most of you know Aaron from the Grey Zone. He has done a good job on the Ukraine war and also on the Duma uh, file. And I would like to go through some of the parts of his article and also watch together some of the videos that are, uh, I believe, relevant uh, to this topic, right? So the explosions happened, both sides are accusing each other, but as I covered already, it's pretty, in my opinion, obvious who benefits from the explosions, right? And this is something that we have learned at the university when I used to study international relations and diplomacy. When you're analyzing the event, the first thing you should do is to check who benefits from this particular event. So. The Baltic Sea bombing of the two Nord Stream gas pipelines threatens to greatly expand the military theater in Europe, says the Wall Street Journal, adding yet another diffuse threat to a growing array of worries from power blackouts all the way to nuclear war, according to the New York Times. But on the other side of the ocean in the United States, the outlook is much rosier. The the idling of Nord Stream, Secretary of State Antony Blinken declared in Washington is a tremendous opportunity. He said that these uh, blasts um, against the Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2 are a tremendous opportunity. So tremendous, in fact, that Blinken repeated it twice during his press conference, and we will watch it together. <laughs> With both Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2 unable to ship Russian energy directly to Germany for the long term, Europe has a tremendous opportunity to once and for all remove the dependence on Russian energy and thus to make away from Vladimir Putin the weaponizing of energy as a means of advancing his imperial designs, Blinken said. That offers tremendous strategic opportunity for the years to come. So this is Secretary of State Antony Blinken. He's talking about this particular incident. So let's see like exactly what he said. Ultimately, um, this is also a tremendous opportunity. It's a tremendous opportunity to once and for all remove the dependence on Russian energy and thus to take away from uh, Vladimir Putin the weaponization of energy as a means of advancing uh, his uh, imperial designs. Uh, that's very significant, and, and that offers 
tremendous um, strategic opportunity for, um, for the years to come. But meanwhile, we're determined to do everything we possibly can uh, to make sure that the consequences of all of this are not borne by citizens in our countries or for that matter around the world. So as you can see, he repeated exactly twice that uh, the blasts against the Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2 represent a tremendous opportunity for Europe to um, leave the dependency or decrease the dependency on the Russian gas. And who is going who is coming and jumping into the wagon of selling the gas to Europe? It's the United States. And we will go through it uh, very soon in the, <laughs> the next part of the video, because the United States is one of the biggest benefactors of uh, stopping the Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2, because it is advertising itself as an alternative for the Russian gas. And we will come to that now. As Europe enters winter in the weeks to come, now, lacking its traditional Russian source of cheap natural gas, ordinary civilians might not appreciate the tremendous strategic opportunity that their predicament offers Washington bureaucrats. Western sanctions on Russia have already led to job losses, skyrocketing bills, and fears of energy rationing amid forecasts of exceptionally cold temperatures ahead. Just before the Nord Stream blast, the head of Germany's Steel Federation warned that without Russian energy, a winter of the industrialization threatens us in Germany. And this is a topic I covered in, the, in a previous video. You can go and watch it in my playlist. And you will see that there is an unspoken plot by uh, the United States against Germany specifically to deindustrialize this country and um, make it dependent on its agricultural sector instead of its industry. Uh, Industrial-wise, uh, at any point of time, today or in the tr tomorrow, Germany, uh, it's more convenient for Germany to buy gas from Russia and hence be dependent on Russia. And also Russia would have more influence over Germany, right? It's, it goes both ways. And for Germany, it makes no sense to buy it from North America. That costs a lot. And uh, the delivery time is also uh, longer and it's costlier. So for Germany, it's always convenient to buy from Russia. So the United States here is trying to stop this project once for all. This is my personal analysis on how I see things. Ahead of this feared winter of the industrialization, Blinken's optimistic response to a now assured shutoff of Russian gas might seem odd for a top diplomat, but it is perfectly consistent with the long-standing US effort to kill Nord Stream for good. Now, I will show you what uh, Jeffrey Sachs, who is an economic professor, said in this regard. So Professor Sachs, uh, he was on, uh, I think, CNBC. Um, I'm not sure the channel, but uh, he spoke about this particular issue. And um, some eyebrows were <laughs> has been raised after his uh, controversial, I would say, quote unquote, uh, comments in this regard, because you're not allowed to say these things on the mainstream media. He's a professor of economics at the University of Columbia. Let's watch it together. The main fact is that the European economy is getting hammered by this, by the sudden cutoff of energy. And now, uh, to make it uh, definitive, the destruction of uh, the Nord Stream pipeline, which I, I would bet was a U.S. action, perhaps U.S. and, and Poland. Uh, this is uh, right, Jeff, speculation. Jeff, we got to stop there. That's, a, that's a quite a statement as well. Why do you feel... Yeah, <laughs> Before I can take it seriously... At, at any point, have you seen any journalist who belong to the mainstream media? This is from Bloomberg or MSNBC or CNN or BBC or even Fox News. Just name it, all of them. Have you seen any of them questioning um, any narrative or argument their guests say who are from the uh, intelligence community or the military industrial complex or an ex-officer when it comes to other countries, when it comes to the war crimes of the United States in other countries, when it comes to uh, war crimes allegations against other countries, such as the chemical attacks in Syria. Do these journalists do their job and ask serious questions or ask what evidence do you have? Uh, 
And even if they do, the other side, oh, our intelligence community uh, concluded that, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and it's just like you have to believe it. But now, because he mentioned this, he 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 jumped in right away, and he wants to stop him from formulating his ideas. Let's continue. Why do you feel Absolutely. that that was a U.S. action? What evidence do you have of that? Well, first of all, there's direct radar evidence that U.S. Uh, helicopters, military helicopters that are normally based in Gdansk, uh, were uh, circling over this area. We also had the threats from the United States earlier in this year that one way or another, we are going to end Nord Stream. We also have a remarkable statement by Secretary Blinken last Friday in a press conference. That he says, this is also a tremendous opportunity it's a strange way to, it's, uh, sorry, it's a strange way to talk if you're worried about the piracy on international infrastructure of vital significance. So I know this runs counter to our narrative. It runs, you're not allowed to say these things uh, in, in, uh, in the West. But the fact of the matter is, all over the world, when I talk to people, they think the okay. U.S. did it. And just to tell you. Well so as you can see, even while he's speaking, uh, you can see, you can hear that they're trying to interrupt him in his ears, professor, 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 all the time to distract him from his ideas. Uh, Jeffrey Sachs has said also um, brilliant uh, things about Syria, and uh, he predicted that this war would be a non-ending conflict and bloodshed, and he urged Obama and Trump to end the CIA regime change war in Syria, and it was a good uh, position from him. Now, if we go back to the article, in waging a multi-year campaign against Nord Stream, the U.S. has sought to weaken Russia's economy, undermine Russian integration with the rest of Europe, preserve lucrative transit fees for the U.S. client stays in Ukraine, and increase European dependence on U.S. energy. Exactly. In particular, liquefied natural gas, LNG. In short, the tremendous opportunity that Blinken draws from the Nord Stream sabotage derives from the very goals that he imputed to Putin, the weaponization of energy for imperial designs. Now, as one of Blinken's predecessors, Condoleezza Rice, explained in 2014, over the long run, you simply want to change the structure of energy dependence. You want to depend more on the North America energy platform. This is what Condoleezza Rice said a few years ago. I will share it with you. And I think uh, the position of the United States, it seems, hasn't changed in this regard. And this video is... Uh, I think, 10 years ago, 8 years ago, or close to that. So let's watch it together. And uh, I also understand that one of the complications is the Europeans, who are very dependent on the Russians for uh, energy supply and business relationships. Uh, but they also need to recognize that if Putin is not stopped now, we could find ourselves in a real conflict with Russia down the road. Well, actually, let me jump in right there. Uh, Germany... <laughs> arguably the strongest power in Europe, at least economically. Um, uh, there's been criticism that Angela Merkel and others haven't been aggressive enough. Uh, what do you uh, think of that? Do you think Germany's been as aggressive as they should be? I'm quite an admirer of Chancellor Merkel, and um, I heard her statement when she was with President Obama in Washington. I thought it was a very good statement. Uh, but now we need to have uh, tougher sanctions, and I'm afraid at some point this is going to probably have to invo involve oil and gas. Uh, the Russian economy is vulnerable. 80% of Russian exports are in oil, gas, and minerals. Uh, people say, well, the Europeans will run out of energy. Well, the Russians will run out of cash before the Europeans run out of energy. And I understand that it's uncomfortable uh, to have an effect on business ties in this way. Uh, but this is one of the few instruments that we have. To, over the long run, you simply want to change the structure of energy dependence. You want to depend more on the North American energy platform, the tremendous bounty of oil and gas that we're finding in North America. You want to have pipelines lines that don't go through Ukraine and Russia. Uh, for years, we've tried to get the Europeans to be interested in different pipeline routes. It's time to do that. And so some of this is simply acting. I mean, wow, she is uh, talking about changing the structures of the um, energy dependency, also speaking about uh, the fees that 
European countries pay to Russia and Ukraine for a transit. Uh, she's talking about major changes in the European economic dependency, as if Europe is um, a vassal for the United States. She's talking about an entire continent, and she wants them to change course. This is what the United States is doing, basically, and has been doing for a very long time. They don't see Europe or European countries as partners, as allies. They see them as subordinates, some um, followers for the American dictates. And this is, unfortunately, uh, when you speak about it, you you are being accused of being a conspiracy theorist, where the fact is you can listen it from the mouth of the horse. She is telling you she wants changes in the structures of the um, energy structures in Europe. And she's not even responsible for that. They have, Europe has its own leaders and they know their national interests, their economic interests, but the United States is deciding for uh, Europe. And this Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2 were for a very long time a matter of concern for the United States because of the increased dependency of the European countries on the Russian gas. And now with Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2 were damaged. Uh, so the question is who benefits? from this. So this is the uh, real question here, right? And I think the answer is very clear uh, for that. But for for the purpose of our um, today's uh, video, I would like to continue just a few more uh, paragraphs from uh, Aaron Mate's article. And I want to show you that this is a non-partisan uh, problem. It's whether Trump or Biden, Democrats, Republicans, it doesn't matter. The United States wants to have an absolute control over the European continent that neighbors Russia. The U.S. drive to promote dependence on North American energy was escalated by President Donald Trump, who imposed sanctions to stop the Nord Stream 2's construction, while urging the German government to buy American liquefied natural gas instead. Nord Stream 2 Trump declared in July 2018 is a tragedy. In his view, it's a horrific thing that is being done, where you are feeding billions and billions of dollars, primarily from Germany, into the coffers of Russia. Trump's sanctions on Nord Stream 2 caused such a rift with Germany that Biden, upon taking office, initially waived them. But the Ukraine crisis gave Biden a backdoor opportunity to revive Trump's quest, so he's basically continuing the Trump policy. As Russian forces amassed on Ukraine's borders in 2021, Biden pressured Germany to commit to can cancelling Nord Stream 2 in the event of an invasion. When the Germans still refused, the White House announced that it would achieve its goals with or without the Germans. If Russia invades, then there will be no longer a Nord Stream 2, Biden declared, with German Chancellor Olaf Scholz at his side. We will bring an end to it. Imagine, like, Biden stands here, and then you have Scholz, who is the leader of Germany, and Biden tells Scholz that we will stop the Nord Stream 2, and believe me, we can do it. And the guy who is responsible for this, who this matter concerns him directly, is just standing next to him. So just imagine how much arrogance you should have and how much you, um, how you look to your partners. This tells you everything about the American policy towards its allies and not about the allies themselves, because the United States is abusing its own allies in order to fill its own packets, because it feels and it knows that the empire is crumbling slowly and slowly. And the war in Ukraine between Russia and NATO is accelerating uh, this uh, downfall of the American empire. So let's watch what Biden said in this regard. Let me answer the first question first. If Germany, if, uh, if Russia invades, uh, that means tanks or troops crossing the, uh, the, the border of Ukraine again, then, uh, Nord Stream 2. We, we will bring an end to it. <laughs> how would you do that? But, do, but how, will you, how will you do that exactly since the project and control of the project is within Germany's control? We will, uh, 
I promise you we'll be able to do it. If this is not creepy, I don't know what uh, creepy means anymore. And I think this is a big insult to um, the German ally, right? Uh, the way, uh, imagine if um, Putin and Assad are standing next to each other and in a press conference and uh, Putin speaks about um, a matter related to Syria, like Syria wants to buy gas uh, or wants to buy gas to a certain country or even exporting some materials and or importing them. And then Russia says, um, if country A um, bombs country B, then we will stop this project in Syria forever. Like the matter has nothing to do with Germany. Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2 are between Russia and Germany. But the war is happening in Ukraine and the United States want to stop an economic project between Russia and Germany in complete disregard for the uh, German interests, I would say. So I would like to uh, just bring your attention uh, to an article published uh, today, and uh, it's from the local, it's a German website, and uh, I unfortunately I can't read the entire article because it is, you have to pay nowadays to these websites, right? And I'm not paying any penny for them. So Nord Stream, the company which owns the, and operates the gas pipeline hit by suspected sabotage last month, has said it cannot examine the pipeline because it has not been given permission by the Swedish, Danish, and Norwegian authorities. I truly wonder why they don't want to give a permission uh, to the company to fix the blasts unless they are hiding something or they are trying to plant some other evidence. And if you think this is a conspiracy theory, then seriously, um, you don't know how this uh, bloodthirsty, uh, power-thirsty maniacs uh, think and plan and execute their plans in order to stay in power. Now, because we, we are speaking about the, the American liquefied natural gas, the United States is representing itself as the alternative. Come, guys, buy from me. I can provide you with gas as much as you want. So what's happening now is that record U.S. liquefied natural gas exports to Europe may not last, the, the, uh, the title says, but there is a record American LNG exports now to Europe with a very high prices. The United States and its Natural gas have been vital for Europe's attempt to fill its gas storage ahead of this winter season. Yet, record U.S. LNG exports have led to a surge in domestic gas prices. The, the boomerang is coming back. When President Joe Biden promised the European Union there would be enough natural gas for its winter, EU politicians rejoiced and doubled down on Russian sanctions. A few months later, EU gas storage is full ahead of storage or ahead of schedule. Meanwhile, however, LNG prices have soared like an eagle. China is reselling Russian LNG to Europe and gas prices in the US are three times higher now than they were a decade ago and up 95% on the futures market for November 2022 to March 2023. And most analysts in Europe are talking about a recession. The US LNG was not going to be enough, was clear from the beginning. As analyst David Blackmon, for example, has repeatedly warned since March, there is plenty of natural gas in the ground in the US, but far from all of it is being extracted. They are, in other words, purely physical constraints to U.S. gas exports to Europe. Then there is the price issue right now. You, the price issue. Right now, U.S. LNG is competitive because of the insane curve the European gas futures market has been following as Gazprom squeezed Nord Stream 1 shipments in response to sanctions. But this doesn't mean U.S. LNG is cheap. In fact, it is not cheap at all, which is what swelled the EU's gas storage refill bill to 10 times its usual. Guys, there are two major things here. One, 
the United States is selling the liquefied natural gas to Europe, and it costs the, his its European partners, allies, ten times more to fill the storage. So, these governments pay ten times more, and who's gonna make it for the gas governments? The people. So. I don't think the people will pay 10 times more of their bill, but they will definitely pay two, three times more. And the government will subsidize the rest. So in all cases, the people will, um, will, will, will carry this on their shoulders. And the government will also probably print money. And this will also increase the inflation. So in whatever side you look at it, the Europeans are... Uh, losers in this. They are losing their economies, they're losing even the trust of their people and um, and personally I really don't see an, um, an exit from this. I think unfortunately uh, the European uh, Union has embedded itself so heavily with the United States that there is no way back and now even more if they start buying uh, the American liquefied natural gas on a long term basis, I think the United States will squeeze uh, the European continent completely and the industrial Germany, unfortunately, and uh, it will lead into complete disaster in the European welfare system. This is just my expectation. I truly hope that I'm wrong and I would be happy if I'm wrong. So who also is benefiting from this crisis, uh, it, and it was mentioned in the Yahoo Economics, also China. And China, what China is doing basically is buying the Russian gas or already bought for a long time ago and now is selling it to Europe. The economic slowdown in China, a Trump-era trade deal and Europe's desperate hunt for natural gas are creating a windfall for some Chinese energy companies. The unusual alignment is helping Europe stock up for the winter. With demand down, Chinese companies that seek, that signed long-term contracts to buy U.S. liquefied natural gas are selling the excess and making hundreds of millions of dollars per cargo. Buyers include Europe, Japan, and South Korea. Just 19 liquefied natural gas vessels from the U.S., docked in China in the first eight months of the year compared with 183 for the same period last year. China is getting nearly 30% more gas from Russia so far this year. Chinese customs data show the boost is due to a scheduled delivery increase from the power of Siberia pipeline and from purchases of Russian liquefied natural gas, typically at a steep discount shipping data shows. Chinese sales to Europe are too small to help the continent avoid potential shortages this winter, but they provide a possible preview of Moscow's increased reliance on Beijing. Russia turned to China for economic and political support following the invasion of Ukraine, yet Chinese companies are undercutting its efforts to sow divisions in Europe by stopping gas exports. So uh, what happened basically, Americans are presenting themselves as an alternative uh, source for liquefied natural gas to Europe and selling it 10 times uh, more than the uh, price. And the Chinese are the Chinese companies, basically, who already bought gas from Russia and the United States, and they don't need all these storages or vessels. They started to sell it. So basically, some parts of the natural gas that Europe is buying right now from China is from Russia. But <laughs> they're just buying it from China with a <laughs> more expensive price. <laughs> I don't want to make further comments on this because this is comical, in my opinion, and it doesn't even deserve further analysis. But uh, today, or I think tomorrow, finally, Habeck, who is the uh, Germany's economy minister, he criticized the United States without naming the United States. Germany's economy minister accused the U.S. and other friendly gas supplier states of astro astronomical prices for their supplies, suggesting they were profiting from the fallout of the war in Ukraine. Oh, my God. 
<laughs> it it doesn't take a genius to realize this, right? And people were talking about it from the beginning, but he just realized it. Anyways, some countries include friendly ones, sometimes achieve astronomical prices for their gas. Of course, that brings us with that brings with it problems that we have to talk about, Robert Habeck said. He called for more solidarity from the US when it comes to assisting its energy pressed allies in Europe. The United States contacted us when oil prices shot up and the national oil reserves in Europe were tapped as a result. I think such solidarity would also be good for curbing gas prices. I mean, just a few months ago when a regular person like me or other journalists uh, warned Germany that the United States is benefiting from the war in Ukraine and is trying to destabilize the economy in Germany. Uh, we have been accused of many things, and I don't want to go into details of this. It doesn't take a genius to see that the United States has parallel goals beside its main goal in Ukraine, which is um, a long war with Russia to drain its economic and military um, I would say, um, powers. And at the same time, uh, the United States wants to hit two birds with one stone, which is Europe. They want to keep, they want to make the European continent completely submissive, to submit to the United States. And that cannot happen unless you weaken the economies of these countries and two, you make them dependent on your um, gas, oil, fuel, materials to, uh, for the sustainability of the economies in Europe. So basically, the United States wants to uh, change the energy structure systems, energy structures in, in Europe from depending on natural gas from Russia, where Russia didn't really impose political goals into depending on uh, the United States natural gas. And that comes with a very high price and cost and compromises and concessions and, and demands of complete submission to the United States. And the way Joe Biden spoke about the Nord Stream 2 when the chancellor of the biggest economy in Europe is standing just next to him tells you, Everything you need to know about the American empire, about its arrogance and about its willingness to stay, up, to stay on top of the international system, even if that means the destruction uh, of, its ally, of the economies of its allies. So this was all for today, guys. Uh, I've been your host, Kirk Almasian of Seriana Analysis. If you're new, please subscribe and hit the like button. It's a great help. And I would like to deliver my... Um, gratitude and and i'm very thankful also for all the supporters of seriana analysis uh, those who are donating and subscribing uh, to the all the means that can uh, help me continue and bring you uh, content like this you can find all the links in the description below you can become a patron you can become uh, join the membership of Syrian Analysis on YouTube. There is the PayPal, etc. It's a great help, guys. Thank you so much. It, it without it, I cannot really continue and bring you all this uh, and spend all this time on reading, summarizing, making notes, recording, and bring you uh, the videos of Syrian Analysis. And see you next time.